Welcome to episode 15 of the Sustainable Tech Partner Podcast, hosted by Joe Panateri. Today's guest is Greenlee CEO, Alexis Normand. We discuss a Series B funding round of $52 million, the evolving funding market, and key priorities for the carbon accounting software company. Alexis, great to see you again. Hey, Joe, great to be here again, indeed. You and I have spoken previously, but for those who missed that conversation, rewind for us. What inspired Greenlee's original business launch and your mission? Sure. Well, you know, it's uh, essentially we we saw that there was going to be this paradigm change when it comes to tackling climate change. Uh, to summarize, you know, in the old world, tracking emissions was this thing for very large enterprises where only basically experts would, would know how to do it. And they'd be either in-house with, you know, uh, a Procter & Gamble's or something type of company. Um, or they'd be outsourcing this to super expert consulting. And that's all good. And they did a very good job. But now, you know, everybody's coming to the realization that uh, uh, pretty much every company needs to answer to the pressure of customer, to the pressure of uh, sometimes regulators with regards to um, tracking emissions. So it's, it's essentially becoming mainstream. Yep. And so uh, from the shift to the old world to the new world, you also have to change the tools. And when before we created Greenly, basically all, all these experts were doing this on spreadsheets and PowerPoints and one-shot consulting assignments. And it struck us that to really have an impact, to really go mainstream, we'd have to be offering a platform uh, that would allow basically in-house uh, expertise, in-house capacity to be built to democratize the knowledge, um, having a much more intuitive walkthrough of how you track your data, how you compute emissions based on this. And so really in a nutshell, we wanted to democratize carbon accounting uh, in this new world of tracking emissions going mainstream. Yep. And for that, we, we had to build entirely new technology to, to bring more people on board. And so not just the enterprise, but also the SMB, the mid-market company, all these guys who, who now have to essentially become front runners of the energy transition. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is, you just described many of the reasons I enjoy speaking with you. Um, You've really been focused on that SMB market and taking carbon accounting uh, automation mainstream. Um, and we've really enjoyed the conversations with you about that. Now, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you've tripled your clientele to about 2,000 customers since, since mm, 2022, give or take. What trends are driving that adoption and that growth? So absolutely. I mean, since our last fundraise, we've uh, done uh, 10x in terms of revenue. So um, uh, and so obviously we, we've we been, um, you know, um, we've been we've had extremely strong tailwinds uh, helping us. This is a, a market which is exponential. Um, and the reasons are the following. Well, obviously, you've got the regulations right everywhere. Uh, in the U.S., uh, you have the SB 253 bill that's passed in California, mandating large companies to track their emissions. Um, in the U.K., uh, in the EU, you've got other regulations like CSRD. But these regulations, they tend to apply first and foremost to these large enterprises. But this thing about carbon accounting is you have to track not just your direct emissions from your operations, but also your indirect emissions from, say, your supply chain. So if you're buying steel from China, if you're buying, you know, um, data centers from some hyperscaler, anything uh, that's part of your supply chain actually indirectly makes you uh, dependent on fossil fuel emissions. So even these large companies tracking their own emissions, they tend to uh, put pressure on their customers because if I'm Google or if I'm Walmart and I've set a trajectory for net zero by 2030 or 2050, I can't do it on my own. I have to bring along my suppliers. And obviously a lot of these suppliers are SMBs, mid-market companies, and suddenly they 
they get this request from this big company and they are essentially at risk of being locked out of procurement if they want to stay in business. It's particularly true in the automotive industry where every car needs to reduce its emissions. It's particularly true in the buildings industry, in the finance industry, where investors want to you know, have greener and greener funds and so on. So you've got this uh, trickle down effect of, uh, th that's bringing actually the, the regulations to much smaller companies. And even if you're in a place where there's no regulation, maybe you're a supplier to some European company or some Californian company or some company that's done a pledge, and so it's coming, you know, it, it, it's there, it's mainstream, it's now. Yeah, yeah, a agreed with you fully. Um, now I'm uh, based in the US and I just wanna give some context to newer listeners and newer readers who may not be familiar with the, the various compliance mandates that you've mentioned. Just very quickly, I'll mention them. CSRD over in the European Union folks, uh, to your point, that is not only for enterprises, it's for the supply chains that interact with those enterprises. So small businesses here in the US that interact with those big EU companies are going to have to comply with that and, and report carbon emissions up to those suppliers. Um, so if, if folks, if you're listening or reading about this, the quickest way to find information is sustainabletechpartner.com with CSRD as content or California, search that, there's regulations there or check out the, the SEC compliance content, um, which is under legal debate, but still moving forward in many ways. So that, that's a quick brain drop for everyone. And, and even that, I mean, who knows uh, when it'll be applied, but if there's only even just a 50% chance, chance that it's applied, mm -hmm. well, you don't wanna be uh, unprepared, right? right? And even if you're not doing it uh, to please the regulator, uh, you may be one of those 5,000 U.S. companies that have sufficient business in the EU uh, that you'll be directly under the regulation, or you may be one of those 5,000 companies doing business uh, in California. So uh, you're here with a topic because of that supply chain effect of your emissions yep. that's fundamentally extraterritorial and that fundamentally has network effects. Uh, and so that's why even small and mid-market businesses are doing this. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, now you pointed out that you, you're not just a, a product feature or a single product. You're actually a, a climate suite. Now, for listeners and viewers who aren't familiar with that, what, what exactly does that mean? And, and by the way, for, for someone who's just getting started on their journey, is there a, a piece of the compliance or the, the climate suite that they would start with first uh, and then expand out? I mean, how do you explain it to newer customers and newer partners? Sure. Well, uh, usually uh, our customers are people who have this, you know, immediate need of uh, tracking the emissions of their company, right? And by the way, they're not just doing it for compliance; they're they're doing it for business reasons in many cases. Uh, but it may just be that it's not your corporation's emissions that you're interested in, but your product emission. I mean, take a look, you know, at uh, Apple's sustainability report. They'll obviously talk about all the great things that they're doing, you know, to reduce their emissions, but they'll give you the uh, product carbon footprint of the latest iPhone or, or iPad or whatever. Um, and so a lot of companies are uh, in this situation where um, they, they may be on a, you know, online platform of some sorts or, or they want to show that their product is a uh, more uh, sustainable alternative uh, uh, than uh, the rest. So, um, so we allow uh, companies to do GHG reports. We allow them to do life cycle assessments. It's what it's mm. called. So it's it's the carbon accounting, but down to uh, the products. Um, and we also allow them to do trajectory setting uh, because one thing you're trying to do uh, when it comes to uh, tracking your emissions is to show that you are not just emitting less, you are avoiding emissions versus a baseline scenario. Right. So, you know, uh, if I have to choose between two phones, you know, maybe uh, I want the most sustainable one or the one that emits the, you know, that consumes the least electricity. Right. Or if I have to choose between two metal manufacturers because I'm building cars, maybe I want to choose the best option. So, you know, this is the value that we're bringing to, to customers is, is 
basically being that third party uh, verifier of this. Do you foresee a day when you go to amazon.com or ebay.com and there's going to be sort of carbon accounting or carbon footprint data there so that you could compare comparative shop in terms of the footprint of products? So, you know, uh, somebody said the, the future is already here, right? It's just uh, evenly spread out. Mm -hmm. So you've got uh, retailers that are already doing this uh, among our customers. So mm -hmm. we have some in the food industry where they'll give you like the uh, footprint of your menu and you can compare, right? Uh, we have one in the do-it-yourself industry. It's an international retailer called Mano Mano. So you could compare between like two screwdrivers or two hammers or or whatever it is. And in the construction industry, it, it has its importance because you, you want to be building low carbon buildings, low carbon material, that kind of stuff. Um, Amazon, since we're talking about them, they're definitely under the, uh, um, they have to comply with the Californian regulations. So they're going to have to track their scope three, their indirect emissions, which entails uh, tracking the emissions of all the people on their marketplace, which they haven't been doing um, uh, up till now. So they're going to have to start asking the question. And when they get the data, they might just decide to showcase it on uh, Amazon itself. So I think uh, that's coming sooner uh, than later, to be honest. Uh, of course, you know, consumers are uh, choosing on price in most cases. But, uh, you know, if, if I want to be choosing on environmental footprint and you have that data, why why keep it away from me, you know? Yep, absolutely, absolutely. So um, now that we have some context in terms of some of the trends in the market and where you focus in the market, let's talk about the news of the day. You know, you and I are speaking on March 20th, 2024. You are now about to announce a Series B funding round. I think it's about $52 million, congratulations. I, and to give some context to our audience, I think you previously raised about $23 million a Series A in 2022. Now, you've grown since the Series A, but yes. the, the, the funding market has also changed considerably in terms of what venture capitalists are asking, the types of companies they want to invest in, the concerns they have in terms of, of growth versus the, the race to profitability. Can you give us, um, without revealing any secrets, but but just how did you evolve your pitch or your approach um, to investors to raise this round versus the first round? Did you make any changes? Yes, definitely. I mean, look, when we uh, raised our, our uh, first round, we had two th 200 customers. Mm -hmm. uh, now we raised with, uh, we had nearly 2,000 customers. So we We've effectively grown 10x, right? Um, uh, and yet, uh, the funding environment was uh, much more difficult because the you know what you expect from a Series A company is not what you expect from a Series B company. Um, you're you're asking for more money, and you're usually asking for a much higher valuation, right? right. So investors have the right to be more demanding in terms of things like uh, you know uh, like uh, how much it costs to acquire a customer versus uh, long-term value uh, retention you know whether your your clients your customers like you or they churn and all that stuff so i think they were much more demanding uh, on the metrics and uh, honestly uh, it didn't feel like uh, because we were a climate tech they were nicer to us you know, they were looking at SaaS metrics like they would for any other business. Yep. Uh, and, and yes, we've had a few no's, uh, as always, as you can imagine. But but uh, to your point, exactly what made this possible, at one point, we realized that this could be more difficult than we expected. So we made a plan for profitability by, you know, June 2024, which, of course, meant growing a little uh being a little slower in our growth uh making a few like focused decisions on what we were going to develop on the product which geographies we were on, uh, going to attack but again this is a very dynamic market so we we made a plan for it and we had consistent progress on that plan to profitability mm -hmm. uh, we also had a, you know a pretty secure uh runway for us to to make sure we'd hit profitability before uh, we ran out of cash, basically. 
and and suddenly when we started having this plan um well uh the conversation uh, started becoming much easier with the investors uh and so not to say that we don't need to be profitable but we can uh decide when to be a little later because we'll be investing you know in in increasing the the team uh, the product team or the sales and marketing team and so on yeah yeah well congratulations you know i'm uh, in in addition to sustainable tech partner i also run channel angels which is an angel investor group and, and i just got to be honest i i don't recall hearing a pitch from a SaaS startup that between series a and series b talks about part a uh 10x growth and part b being near profitability or having a clear path to profitability within the next few months uh, those two metrics together are practically unheard of congratulations well, it's great well, news. thank you and you know not to say we're, we're perfect we we obviously have a lot of things to work on and on the product, on the, uh, you know, uh, retaining customers uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but we're also on a great market uh, mm -hmm. and I'm lucky to, to you know, work with great uh, team members as well. So, uh, so yeah, I guess we, we're lucky in that respect. Fantastic, fantastic. So now that you've done the raise, the Series B, do you have certain priorities for the money in terms of where you're gonna invest it, where you're gonna focus your growth opportunities? Sure, so, so I'd, I'd say it's, uh, it's pretty simple you know it's two things really one is the product so we you know it's a competitive market we have to uh, keep working on offering the the most intuitive simple user experience and yet the most precise so it's things like uh you know the the way uh the, the reasons why uh, we've been able to secure so many customers is not because we're a generalist carbon accounting platform it's because we uh, go deep into specific verticals and and so we we create expertise in tracking uh, emissions for tech companies by uh, taking a deep dive into their cloud, you know, and and modeling for each minute of VCP or GPU consumption, the kilowatt hour electricity consumption, and then translating this into CO two according to the energy intensity of your electricity every hour, you know. So uh, that's what going deep uh, means. And we have to keep doing this. So more integrations, more uh, deep dive integrations in IT, in manufacturing, in finance, you know, in retail. Um, on our core product, we have beyond the tracking to keep improving the, the uh, automatic generation of decarbonization roadmap. So it's one thing to track really really well where the emissions come from in your supply chain like buying steel and everything it's another to to create um precise decarbonization roadmaps where you're going to tell a company how it's going to reduce its emissions by 50 percent uh in the next 10 years and telling it it's it's by uh changing it's working on that part of your emissions. Maybe you're buying of steel by changing that supplier uh, and going from one to the next. So it's all about the accuracy of the data mm -hmm. to be able to make precise recommendations on how you redesign your products. And, and of course, it sounds like a lot of work. So you, and it is, unless you have a product that uh, comes to you with templates, templates of action plans, uh, that you can easily modify templates of uh, things that you can uh, redesign in your products and so on. So a lot of work in the product on what we do already, GHG plus reduction, uh, on uh, doing product carbon footprint. So we're launching uh, what we call an LCA builder, a lifecycle assessment builder. Uh, and of course, this is again a tool uh, that has existed for experts for a long time. But if you go mainstream, on tracking emissions, uh, you have to simplify the UX. And the re the way we're doing this is we're providing like a you know a library of about right now 200 templates uh, for you to easily track the emissions of uh, your product. So we have templates for phones, we have templates for clothes, we have templates for handbags, we have templates for screwdrivers, all that stuff. So you don't have to come in and be an expert to build your product carbon footprint. You can take our template and then say, oh yeah, well, all I need is to change that component and so on. So, so you hyperscale this and you can even bring in partners. So GHG, LCAs, and we're adding an academy, you know, uh, 
Yeah, I was going to ask about the academy. This is the uh, the Climate Academy, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, again, uh, none of us were taught at school how climate change works. It's a, uh, I mean, people have known about it for a long time, but it was uh, restricted uh, knowledge for experts only. And now every company has to do it. So you you need to get people to know about these fundamental. Uh, concepts of scope one, two, and three, but deep dive into how you compute this, what type of strategy you can put in place, and so on. And so um, there aren't just enough people um, knowledgeable about this. So using our tool, you do learn stuff, but we also wanted to uh, you know, educate our, our users, educate our market. And so we're bringing online uh, free courses that certify you and that uh, will able uh, that will allow you to essentially progress because the reality of our market, you know, is seventy percent of our customers are first time carbon accountants. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the world we live in, and and we have um, and we need to help these guys out. Yep. Yep. So, you know, it's interesting up, up in the enterprise, you, you know, you hear about, for, for instance, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Accenture, KPMG and others helping customers with carbon accounting, right? In, in the SMB space, um, you're striving to make it much easier for SMBs to consume this type of software in, in a very global way. But will you bring some partners along, boutique consulting firms, carbon accounting firms that help SMBs? with the consumption of this and the setup? How do, how do you feel about that? Yeah, for sure. So I, I would say, uh, you know, up to now, um, the the cake was maybe a little too small to be sharing it uh, with solutions partners and integrator. You can only bring in uh, consultants uh, when um, you, you're working with the enterprise, you know, mm -hmm. or at least the large mid-market companies, because there's one thing to have a platform and allow your customers to be autonomous. It's another to like take your platform, give it to consultant and roll it out. So of course, uh, you know, we've been at this for four years, so we are not the same company we were two years ago. Our platform is now much more sophisticated. We're, we're able to bring on board much uh, larger customers with more complex organizations, multi-entities and so on. And so, of course, culturally, these organizations are looking for a lot more support. And mm -hmm. so we, we have now begun uh, onboarding, you know, ESG consultants or auditors to roll us out. I, I would say it's still a minority part of our business, but definitely as part of our Series B, we'll be attacking much larger accounts. And that means having more, um, you know, channel distributors. Uh, and integration partners. So, so I guess we'll we'll be following the the route that others have taken before us. You know, uh, very classic. But but we had to wait until we got uh, to that particular maturity level. Got it. Understood. And and please keep us posted on that. That's near and dear to our readership. They're very very interested in what you're doing there. Um, and speaking of which, for readers and customers who would like to get some more information about Greenly or you, is there a particular landing page or a place they can go to get started and kick the tires? So super easy. I mean, our, our website, www.greenly.earth. Uh, and actually, if you're a very small business, there is even a self-serve function. So you don't need to speak to any one of our sales. You can get started right away. If you're like a 15 people company and you say, why would I do this if I'm so small? But maybe you're you know, a supplier to, to some company who's asking. Uh, so, you know, I, and you'll get the basic package. And at some point, uh, maybe you'll want to talk to us to upgrade. Fantastic. Um, well, thanks for the update and uh, congratulations again on the funding. Well, thank you. <laughs> this podcast is copyright of Sustainable Tech Partner and Mentori Ventures. Music written, performed, and copyright of my son, also named Joe Panettieri. <laughs>